Welcome into the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM, the king of sports books. I'm your host today, Brendan Glasheen, joined by Sean Zarillo and Billy Ward. That means the UFC betting previews are back. We returned last week. If you're just hopping in, welcome. Please subscribe, rate, and review because every Friday, Zarillo and Billy Ward will be giving out underdogs, props, and possibly best bets or final bets uh, in the UFC. UFC Vegas 86 at the Apex facility in Las Vegas. I tried to ask Billy and Sean before we started recording how they're feeling about this event compared to last week. And last week they're like, well, you know, I think next week's card's actually pretty good. And now, now I think they don't like their bets as much. But that does not mean they didn't do their homework and have found edges for this week. Um, but that's how it goes. Some cards are better than others. Betting value or just like fights that you want to watch, right? There's, those are two separate things. So the main event, uh, which Zarillo, you're interested in, Joe Pfeiffer taking on Jack Hermanson uh, this weekend. Uh, Hermanson is the older fighter, 35 years old. Pfeiffer is 27. Uh, Hermanson is a significant dog uh, in this main event. Um, not as significant as we've previ- previously seen in main events, but uh, plus – uh, plus 210 on the money line over at Bet MGM. Pfeiffer at minus 275. When you identify uh, the line, is it fair? And how would you like to bet the fight? I like Jack here at plus 210. I made this line closer to plus 175. The market has come down a little bit. He was closer to plus 220, plus 230 even. So it seems like it is starting to tick his direction. In terms of a pre fight side, though, I think Joe Pfeiffer and Pfeiffer by knockout in particular might be the way that I would want to bet this if I didn't like the underdog. If I was interested in Pfeiffer, I'm looking to take Pfeiffer early and his finish props. I do think the earlier part of the fight should be where he has his most success and where he looks the best and also where he should have a high likelier chance of finishing Hermanson as opposed to the other way around. I think if this fight extends, it certainly lends itself to Hermanson, who's been five rounds on four occasions. He's been in, I believe, booked for eight different five-round fights. This is the fourth five-round fight he's been booked for in the UFC. The other three all went the distance. Pfeiffer in his career has only seen a third round one time, and that, I believe, was eight years ago. So experience, strength, the schedule, all of which favor Hermanson. Grappling upside as well, also in his corner. The striking upside and the range where this should be fought early certainly favors Pfeiffer, who's the stronger man, the faster man, hits harder. Uh, so when these two are striking earlier, the way the early fight should play out, in my opinion, Hermanson likes to be on the outside of the octagon, kickboxing opponents, sticking and moving, kicking the leg, moving around, but staying out of danger. Pfeiffer isn't going to see the power to keep him off of him. So he's probably going to close the distance, pressure Hermanson up against the cage and look to box him up and potentially knock him out. He carries a ton of power in his hands. I know there was this thing going around yesterday about whether he punches harder than Francis Ngannou or not. That's a complete joke. But Pfeiffer does hit very hard for a middleweight. His knockouts are very impressive. He takes guys off of their feet. And I think if he connects clean on Jack, he's either going to knock him out or going to hurt him. So the early rounds, as I said, round one and round two probably favor Pfeiffer. And you can look to live better for Manson after those rounds, likely after rounds two and three, if he survives as this fight extends, I think it's going to play to his favor. So if Pfeiffer doesn't get that early knockout, I expect Hermanson to work his way back into the fight. I like his money line pre-fight at plus 220. I do think he could be competitive in the early rounds. I just think it's likely your Pfeiffer wins them and you get a better number of the live market. So Hermanson pre-fight plus 220, I think is okay. Live entry probably better after rounds two and three. And if you like the favor pre-fight, would take his knockout prop. Okay. Billy Ward pens the weekly underrated fighters to target for UFC fight night. Uh, the luck ratings uh, over at Action Network. And Billy, you find the line to be fairly valued. So how would you approach uh, finding an edge? Yeah, it's interesting. and I, I mostly agree with Sean's analysis here. It's one of those fights where I think, you know, having watched a little bit more tape than I have since Monday, it feels too long, but I also kind of have a hard time seeing how Hermanson gets the win. Like, I expect him to look like a closer uh, underdog than the line suggests, but still probably end up losing it. And for a couple of reasons, I think the power optics of Hermanson versus Pfeiffer just can be really bad to the judges. Even if Jack's not landing him three to one, you know, Jack's never landed a knockdown in the UFC. Pfeiffer's just out here starching people. 
I think that, you know, is going to help and swing some rounds that, you know, we might be arguing after should have gone to Hermanson when we look at the stats, but when you watch it in real time and see Pfeiffer landing big, is going to be tough. And then the other thing, Pfeiffer, I think, is an underrated grappler. I say I think because we've seen him in some pro grappling matches, but only against other UFC fighters, not guys who are full-time grapplers. So it's a little bit harder to judge. But he's not horrible on the mat. And the way we're scoring fights now, Hermanson getting a takedown but not doing much with it probably doesn't win him around either. With all that said, love Sean's points about the cardio and the you know five-round experience for Hermanson. On top of that, Pfeiffer's aggression doesn't really work well over a long period of time. Some guys, we haven't seen them go five rounds, and then they look great the first time they do. I don't think that'll be the case with Pfeiffer if it gets extended. He's swinging hard on everything. He's going for explosive takedowns when he shoots. All that doesn't translate well over five rounds. So Hermanson Live is probably my favorite angle, but in terms of pre-fight, just as a way to try to bet that this is closer than the line implies, I think I'm going over two and a half rounds at plus 125. Other angle, you know, if you have books where they offer the split round props, taking some combination of Pfeiffer early, Hermanson late, Mm -hmm is an option. But yeah, I love the live play. I think that's, you know, my favorite single angle, assuming it works out where we get a better line. But also just taking the over, assuming that Hermanson can extend this a little bit, get some takedowns, stay safe early, and then Pfeiffer, you know, finish or whatever happens at the end. It doesn't matter. We've already cashed our ticket if we get to the end of the third round. Zarello, is there something that you might see in the fight? Because when you mentioned you both have talked about live betting on UFC events. Is there something that might that you're going to keep in mind that you see and say, wait a minute, even though the line might be there, it's something I noticed when you watch, like I'm not going to touch Hermanson because you, you saw, so- is there something you're keeping an eye out for? Yeah. It depends on Piper's approach early. You know, this is Piper's first round five round fight. There's a chance that he comes out and isn't as aggressive as he typically is and tries to fight more of that medium to low tempo kickboxing match where he does have the power advantage, right? So he only really needs to land the most impactful strike of the round against Hermanson, who's going to be trying to kick him a bunch in order to win the round. So there's a chance that Pfeiffer's pace is not as aggressive as it normally is and that he attempts to conserve his cardio. And maybe his cardio, now that he's in his prime, eight years removed from his last three-round fight, maybe his cardio is better than we give it credit for, you know, now that he's in his athletic prime in the prime of his career. So definitely want to watch him, how he approaches the fight, how he's approaching the fight early. But if he's up to his, you know, typical style, throwing power behind every shot, pressuring nonstop over the first two rounds, I would eventually expect him to gas out just based on historics and past optics of his fights and the fights that have extended. So, uh, you know, Hermanson's advantages here, aside from potentially getting on top and having a very good top game, it comes down to cardio and experience. So rounds three, four, and five should benefit him. But yeah, it it definitely depends how Pfeiffer approaches things early and relying on him to be aggressive and going for the finish and not getting it. Good one. I'm, in the Real quick, I'm, ahead, I'm, yep. saying, I'm glad you brought that up. I meant to mention that when talking about the over. I think sometimes guys like this, you know, they want to fight for a title at some point. I think we see sometimes where fighters come out and they want to prove they can fight into the championship yeah. round. So they do, you know, they're not hunting the finishes aggressively early just because they want to show that, which, again, if that's what we think, Pfeiffer, even if there's a chance he does that, getting the over two and a half at plus money, I think makes some sense on that because – you know, it could be just trying to conserve cardio or it could be to say like, hey, look, guys, I can fight four or five rounds if I need to and get a late finish or go the distance and be OK. Just as a way of saying like, you know, I'm main event material, I'm championship ready. So I think that's a something to consider as well. And they also they sometimes too, you know, stri- strikers like Pfeiffer, he won his last fight via submission, showed good wrestling. There's a chance that he comes out and tries to prove, hey, I'm the better grappler than Jack too early, you know, and he tires himself out trying to grapple. So that actually may be something where I'd be more encouraged by a live bet. You know, if he's not engaging in that low tempo kickboxing match, if he's actively trying to grapple Hermanson, wrestle him using energy to stay on top, Hermanson may be losing the round, but in my mind, he's just draining time off the clock and draining energy out of Piper's gas tank, even if he's on bottom. So I'd actually be encouraged to see Piper grappling Hermanson early if I'm betting Hermanson, just because I think the gas tank is not going to be to Piper's benefit later. So... Uh, yeah, that, that happens oftentimes too. They not only do guys try to prove that their main event material, they can go five rounds. They also try to prove, Hey, I'm more well-rounded than you think. I'm not just going to come here and box this guy up and knock him out. I'm going to try to out grapple him first. So very much a possibility that Pfeiffer wrestles from the outset and tries to prove that he's a better grappler too. Middleweight bout on the main card is our fight of the night. Uh, Hodolfo Vieira versus 
Armen Petrosan. Uh, right now, you can find the line at BetMGM. Uh, let's see here. I had it up a second ago. So uh, it's about even money. Vieira minus 125 on the money line. Petrosan is plus 105. Uh, same question here, Zarillo. When you look at the line, fairly valued, and how would you like to bet this one? This fight was rebooked uh, from a card a few weeks ago, or I should say a couple months ago, uh, that was down in Brazil. Petrosian on the day of the fight apparently got sick and pulled out. May have had something to do with anxiety. Not 100% sure why he pulled out, but that was the apparent rumor. Uh, this is a very binary matchup, and... Vieira, a guy I typically bet against because, again, not a fighter with good cardio. In fact, he's proven that when he gets extended beyond the first round, his gas tank tends to wilt. He has more trouble getting takedowns. He is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, one of the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners in the world fighting in combat sports. And Petrosian, while he's proven against other grapplers that he can survive, work his way back up, work his way back into the fight and win, this is the highest level grappler he's faced and all of his opponents do tend to get him down to the ground early so even though Vera doesn't have the best wrestling I do expect him to get on top here in the first round and to put Petrosian in some very dangerous positions uh so Vieira pre-fight money line I think is the right side I projected him closer to minus 125 I actually prefer his submission prop at plus 180 and I think you take either Vieira's money line or his submission prop into the fight and then you look to bet on Petrosian live after round one if he's still there and try to get not plus money on both sides necessarily if you're taking Vieira's money line, but with the submission prop on Vieira and then Petrosian's money line. Hopefully you're riding about plus 180 and then plus 200 on Petrosian on either side after the first round. So I think the smaller cage here is certainly going to be at Vieira's benefit. Doesn't have to go as far to close the distance to land the takedowns. Uh, but if this stays on the feet for any extended amount of time, Petrosian is the much better kickboxer, much more technical, and also has the better cardio. So pre-fight, if you like the underdog, or not the underdog necessarily is a pick and fight, but if you like Petrosian right. pre-fight, I would look to bet his round two and round three props. I think he should be much fresher in the final two rounds and have a good chance of finishing Vieira on the feet if Vieira can't get takedowns. But pre-fight, I certainly want Vieira's submission prop, as I said about plus 180, you could actually look to take his money line too. I think there's a chance that he just controls uh, Petrosian for two rounds and then maybe enough in the third to survive. But I wouldn't really want to sweat that as much. I think there's actually a chance we get a draw here too. You can very much see a Vieira 10-9 uh, round one and two being gassed in the third round and then Petrosian 10 8 him with strikes and this ending up in a draw. So there's a lot of ways this fight can go. Uh, you know, binary fights. Uh, you know, tend to have, I would say, the highest potential for a 10-8 round and therefore a draw. But I don't think this is the worst fight to play a draw, but I'm, I'm going to take Vera's submission prop pre-fight. Yeah, going back to November, um, the broadcast said Petrosian fell ill backstage, was said to have been vomiting. Uh, that's why the fight was axed back in early November. So, and Billy, reading from your luck ratings right up, uh, you identify Vieira as an undervalued fighter. Want to expand on that? Well, the line's moved a little bit since then. I think Fair enough. Like yep. he's a slight favorite now. But no, I mean, I'm really glad Sean brought up the cage. That's, to me, the significant difference between this time and the first time it was booked is we have one guy who needs to be physically grabbing you to win a fight and another guy who needs to be as far away as possible to win a fight. Now we put him in a smaller cage. Obviously favors Vieira there. You know, Sean also mentioned that, you know, it's a higher level of grappler than Petrazian has uh, survived against. I did the full breakdown of this one, and I looked up, you know, some of the past opponents. He got taken down twice by Gregory Rodriguez, who's also fighting on this card, managed to survive that. G-Rod's best accomplishments in terms of just pure sport grappling is he won the world championships at Blue Belt, which is like your first two to three years of grappling. And Hidalfo Vieira has won, you know, the open weight ADCC at Black Belt. His nickname's the Black Belt Hunter. Like, just the most accomplished BJJ guy we've had in the UFC in a very long time. So hugely different levels to that. Other than that, I totally agree with Sean's analysis. I think it's Vieira early. You know, you could play him in round one or round two. If you have a book that does split props, if you have a book that does same game parlays, all those unders. And then, you know, if you're watching it, I'd re much rather be playing Petrazian live than trying to pick his pre-fight method of victory, you know, because is it a round three finish? Is it a decision? Any of those things. The only other pre-fight angle, I think I prefer Vieira inside the distance at plus 150 over his submission. 
submission is way likelier, but the difference between plus 175 and plus 150 just isn't there for me that he doesn't control him on the ground and, you know, elbow him in the head a few times or whatever the inverse of a club and sub is. And we need a catchy word for that where a grappler ends up getting a TKO instead of a submission when they could have had the submission, but chose to be the guy's head in. It's, it's a, uh, it's a snap, no tap because uh, it's the injury TKO where the ref has to call it off, but the fighter never taps. And it's a submission that leads to a technical knockout. Uh, So it's, it's a snap, no tap. Or, you know, just like he's controlling you on the back instead of going for the choke, he just pounds you out and finishes it that way. There's just enough angles there where I don't think it's entirely likely, but when the lines are this close, I'm not going to get greedy, right? I'd be real upset if I had that Vieira submission ticket. He's dominating him on the ground and then lands one big shot and Herb Dean or whoever jumps in and waves it off rather than the submission. So I get where you're coming from. Like it's super, by far the likeliest way he finishes it is a submission, but I'm, I'm playing a little bit scared here, I guess, taking the inside the distance rather than sub specifically. UFC Vegas 76 again is on, uh, I didn't say this at the top, ESPN Plus is where you can watch. Uh, the main card starts at 7, prelims at 4. And speaking of the prelims, Arillo, when we talk underdogs, you've identified a prelim fight that you think there's an edge on the dog. Timothy Kwamba. Uh, This line is about plus 165 last night. It is definitely moving his direction. This fight was just booked. Kwamba is a late replacement for Demir Hadzovic. Both of these fighters, Kwamba and Balagioki, who's the favorite in the matchup, are debutants coming off a contender series. And that is why this is a tough card to bet in general. There's a number of fighters making their debuts off a contender series or just making their UFC debuts in general who we don't have a ton of information about, don't have a ton of tape on you know, may have one or two fights that we could find. But beyond that, difficult to gain a lot of information on them. But do like to see the line moving towards Kwamba. He did take this fight on short notice, as I mentioned, four days notice. He's also moving up a weight class. So neither of those things in his favor. But he is the hometown fighter, trains full time in Las Vegas at Extreme Couture. So he's well-trained. He's extremely well-rounded. He's also going to have the home crowd in his favor there, too. On the Contender Series, the building was about as loud as I've ever heard for a fighter there because he had all of his family and friends there from Las Vegas. Not sure how the ticketing works for uh, Apex events that are actual UFC events as opposed to Contender Series. Maybe he's just going to have far fewer people in the crowd. But anybody who's there from Las Vegas, I would imagine, will be rooting for Kwamba. This fight should just be closer and competitive, more competitive than the money line indicates. I think this is basically going to play out as a pick fight. Oki should have more finishing upside early. And as the fight extends, I think Kwama is going to be the more well-rounded man. And uh, keep this very close, both on volume, mix in some grappling. I just, you know, to me, I projected this fight much closer to 50-50. Again, the short notice nature, potentially the size differential should favor Oki. But beyond that, this is a close and competitive fight. And one that likely goes all 15 minutes. I see fight goes to decision opening up plus money. That's probably going to interest me too. Maybe a high volume more, but one that likely goes off 15 minutes. So Kwamba sitting best price right now. If you shop around as plus 155, would look for the best number you can find because the market is all over place. Uh, between 135 and 155, as I said, this opened 165 yesterday. And it seems like it's moving down quicker in some books than in others. So make sure to shop around for the best price. But Timothy Kwamba, my favorite underdog other than Hermanson on Saturday's card. Okay. Billy, um, underdog for you. And I think similar to what we discussed, it, it's very important to note that, yes, the lines move based on when you put out your luck ratings article. And that's the case for the for the dog that you like on the prelim card. Yeah, I ended up going with two here just because of the okay. movement on the one. Bog, Bogdan Guskov fighting the Ultimate Fighter veteran, Zach Pauga. You know, he's plus 115, plus 120 earlier in the week. I think the best you can get is plus 105 right now if you shop around, plus 100 at BetMGM. Literally last night at like midnight when I was putting these in, <laughs> it was a better line. So this one's been falling the whole time. Pretty pretty clearly, I think the right side to be on and the line movement indicates that. So I guess it's more of just a shameless plug for my luck ratings than it is actually a pick that <laughs> I'm suggesting at this moment, but I still like it even at even money. And then the other one, Bruno Brazil, I think she's climbed as high as like plus 240 some places not quite that oh plus 240 at betmgm good uh just another one it's the likeliest card fight on the card to go to a decision by the odds judges are going to be involved two smaller fighters hard to tell who's hitting harder should be mostly a striking matchup with loma look bone me you're kind of just betting that the judges 
possibly screw something up or this one's hard to judge. Anytime we get north of like plus 200 on a fight, we think goes to a decision, especially when we don't think one fighter is going to dominate the grappling and make it clear that they're better. That's pretty easy for me just on the, you know, I'm not saying she's a better fighter, but just based on the systemic way that we like to look at that, I think that one's pretty easy. How about props for UFC Vegas 86, Zerillo? Where might we look for props this week? Co-main fight on the card, Danny Gay versus Andre Feely. This is, along with the main event, one of the two fights that are definitely worth checking out this weekend. Uh, this, I believe, is another short-notice booking. I'm not sure who Feely is replacing on late notice, but he did take this fight on a couple weeks' notice. And I don't know if this matchup is great for him just due to the massive advantages that Ige has, both in terms of durability and power. Uh, this is probably going to be a very high-volume striking fight. Ige, not the most high-volume striker, but I should say a higher-paced uh, brawl. I don't really see either guy taking the other down and consolidating position for significant stretches of time. Maybe Ige, who's a little stronger, is likelier to hold position up against the fence for periods of time, but to me, just massive advantages in terms of hardware for him here against Feely, who probably has a speed advantage, but this is another fight as we talk about from time to time where the guy with more power is a bit shorter and at a reach disadvantage, and Ige, who is the better boxer, is going to look to crash that pocket, get inside, and land the power shots on Feely. So I like Ige to win this fight by knockout. I got it at plus 320. Definitely shop around for a number there. You can find as low as plus 230 or plus 250. And I said as high as plus 320, depending on where you're betting that. So make sure to shop around for the best number. Uh, and then Ige in finish only markets as well. I believe I saw him at minus 120, minus 125. That's super short. Ige should be like minus 200, minus 225. If you're betting any finish only markets here. If you like the Feely side, I would probably lean to him by decision or the fight to go over. I think he likely wins a competitive decision if he does win. Maybe even Philly on the uh, the spread, the plus three and a half points, would be another way to play him as well. But don't love that just because I give all the fin finishing upside to Dan Ige. So Ige by knockout, plus 320. Uh, Philly has just, even though you don't see a number of knockouts on his record, he gets mm -hmm. wobbled in nearly every fight. And Ige is the biggest puncher he's faced in a while. I should also mention his last knockout came in the apex. Ige's last two knockout wins in the apex. So I think the the close nature, the smaller cage, you're just going to force them both into the pocket. That de definitely benefits Dan Ige. Feely was hoping to be in the Oct I'm reading here from UFC.com, was hoping to be in the Octagon by March and then got, like you said, short notice, found out in January that he'd have an opportunity here against Ige. So um, Andre Feely 2.0. Is, is is it is he ready to go on short notice? So there's some edges there, I guess, uh, by your standards on Ige. Billy, uh, prop market. Where might we be looking this week? Yeah, I'm looking. I believe it's the first fight of the night, although they keep shuffling the order here. Daniel Marcos and Arichi <laughs> Keeling. Love the under two and a half here at plus money, plus one fifty. I was a little surprised at that line. I guess the reasoning is neither fighters had too many finishes in their fight. But there's a knockdown in almost every one of their fights. It's just they've managed to power through it. So I'm looking it up. In a Richie Key Lang's fights, he's had six UFC fights. Five of them, somebody's been knocked down. Only two of them finished by knockout. Marcos has two knockdowns, either for or against him. I think both for him in his three fights. One of them finished, one didn't. And I think it's one of those things that we expect to regress to the mean when you're looking at the UFC statistically. If there's knockdowns, 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 those should turn into knockouts at a fairly high clip. I'm assuming that's what happens here. Neither guy really likes to grapple, so you could also specifically go fight ends by knockout. The price difference wasn't quite enough for me to feel good about that because, again, you know, club and sub, knock a guy down, jump on his back, choke him out, whatever. So <laughs> plus 150 on the under two and a half could also go fight, doesn't go to the decision. Anything like that. I understand that it's a little bit lighter weight class, so sometimes we don't expect the finishes at the bantam weights, but these guys are just throwing, you know, don't really see great chins on either side, especially Origi Kilang. Both guys throw hard, so like the under. Okay, where it might be, well, first off, do we have a best bet this week from either of you? I'm always intrigued by that. And uh, what are we looking for this week, Zarillo, for a best bet? What jumps out? No, I think Hermanson Live is probably my favorite bet on the card. Uh, okay. But in terms of another bet that I like, just as much as the other ones that I've given out here, no more, no less, Gregory Rodriguez, 
and Brad Taveras over two and a half rounds. That's about minus 120. You can also get the fight to go to a decision closer to even money, even plus 110 at the best number out there. The biggest threat to a finish in this fight, or the biggest threats, Taveras via knockout has pillowish hands uh, and tends to be throwing a lot more leg kicks later in his career. Or Gregory Rodriguez via submission. And as Billy pointed out, Rodriguez's best accomplishment in jiu-jitsu is winning a blue belt title. Uh, he tends to get the back on a lot of his opponents. He's really good at taking the back. Not as good at finishing from that position. And Brad Taveras is not only very durable, I believe he's never been submitted in his professional career. Uh, he's not in 28 professional fights. And he does have very good first layer takedown defense too. I do expect Rodriguez to get his back at some point. I may even expect Taveras to wobble Rodriguez at some point. It seems like Rodriguez gets wobbled in nearly all of his fights too. But ultimately, I think both of them uh, don't necessarily have the threat to finish where the other is potentially weakest or most vulnerable to being finished. Just as I said, Taveras doesn't carry enough power in his hands to really threaten the knockout. And I think his submission defense is good enough to fend off Rodriguez, even if he's getting grappled. So I like this fight to go the distance, to go all 15 minutes. I expect Rodriguez to win that decision, but I would never count Brad Taveras out of a fight that is going all 15 minutes. Very good record in decisions across his career, 13 and four across that 28 fight career. So Brad Taveras, probably the value side of the money line, but I like this fight to go over two and a half rounds or to reach a decision, which does benefit the underdog. And Billy, for your best bet, the line is actually uh, moving t- towards where you want to bet it, I think, right? As far as the, the price, you're getting a better price. So the line is going against you, I would I would imagine, here with Jeremiah Wells. Yeah, this one's been all over the place, depending on when you look. He was a heavier favorite, then it came down. It seems like it's going back up today. So okay. tough one if you're trying to play the line movement game. I just like Wells here. Not going to say it's a best bet, more of a final bet. You know, I'm going to say, you know, for a little behind the scenes here, Zerillo did not have his best bet in until late here. I would love to change my best bet to his. I think that's actually a great call. Brad Tavares, just one of those. He's like a classic tough out. Like, he doesn't look like he does anything yeah. all that well, but he's just super hard to look good against. But, no, I do like Wells. Um, he, he lost his first UFC fight last time in a fight he was dominating, got choked unconscious in the third round. Always cardio issues, extremely good grappler, probably the best grappler in the division at this point, I'd say, in just like pure grappling. But man, does he gas out, and it doesn't look good when he does. To his credit, rather than tap out to the choke, he just went to sleep. So I always like people that are going to fight for my money. You know, I, I, tapping to a choke is, you kind of don't have to. If you Instead of tapping, you could have been doing this and fighting the choke. Like that, minus 148 is where I got him, I think, Minus 155 or so is the best you can find now. Anywhere in there. Also a classic one, if you want to bet him by finish or him early and then try to come back in live on Max Griffin, even if you're holding this minus 150 or so pre-fight ticket, if Griffin balloons up to plus 300, plus 400 because Wells dominates early, I'm hedging off on that one. As much as I like Jeremiah Wells, I could have got like plus 1,000 on his opponent last time. Didn't Mm. take it, have been mad about it ever since. So if you see those opportunities on Max Payne Griffin, definitely take that. You're going to be real sad if it if it goes that way, as I was. Yeah, I like Griffin live. Uh, and I also like uh, against one of your other bets, Zach Paoga, I think live after the first round as well. Goose got very dangerous in the first round and then should completely fall apart. And Paoga, uh, more of a grinder. I could see him actually winning a decision there. I wouldn't be super surprised if those props cashed at like plus 400, plus 450. But yeah, Paoga, Griffin... Both, I think, solid live bets. And, you know, this is, other than that, like a pretty good card to gather information for future fights. As I said, a number of Debbie Cons, not a lot of information, and not a lot of fights that I'm particularly interested in betting. Probably going to have under two and a half or three units total risk across this card. But, uh, yeah, a couple of good live spots worth attacking. And I'll, I'll post all of uh, my live spots that I'll be targeting on Twitter. Yeah, awesome. real quick on that. I th- I think like every pre-fight bet I have, or almost every, I'm going to be looking to hedge live. Like I mm. partially just not feeling super confident about the side I'm on, but some of them are just such clear binary fights. I, I like your point with Pauga. The only thing I don't like there is, you know, he went down to 205 where his frame fits better, but like the guys at 205 are just better than at heavyweight. So it's kind of a catch 22 there, even with the cardio, if he's cutting significant weight, but yeah, I think this is one of the better live betting cards in a long time because we have so many fights where one guy's got the finishing equity, 
a lot of Brazilians and or Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys who love that one round dump the tank, try to squeeze you to death. And then if that doesn't work, kind of don't have a plan B. So I, that's a really good take. I'm going to be hedging almost everything I have here. Playing the live movement game, uh, Wells, uh, BetMGM, as we record on a Friday morning, is offering minus 150 on Jeremiah Wells right now. So there you go. That'll do it here on the UFC betting preview episode here on the Action Network podcast, UFC Vegas 86, 4 o'clock Eastern time. The prelim start Saturday and then the main card at 7 o'clock. We are presented by our friends at BetMGM. Find more from Sean and Billy as Sean Tees. You can find Sean on Twitter at Sean Zarillo. Uh, for any updated uh, picks, as well as uh, what he might be looking towards with more information coming out before Saturday afternoon on the Action website as well. Don't forget to download the free award-winning Action Network app to follow these guys and their picks. Best of luck with all of your picks this weekend. There's a lot more going on, understandably. Uh, So best of luck to you. We'll see you next time on the Action Network podcast, presented by BetMGM.